Father in heaven, we pause for a moment before opening your sacred word to recognize that you are the author of the word. Lord, it is your spirit that has inspired the word, and so we need your spirit to come instruct us in the word. Lord, you have given the promise, the beautiful promise of John chapter 16 and verse 13, that the Spirit of truth will guide us into all truth. And Father, this morning we are not satisfied with some truth, with half truth, or with part of truth. Father, this morning we want to be led into all truth. And Lord, we pray this morning that you will show us a clearer, more perfect, more biblically accurate picture of Jesus. For, Father, that is why we have come, to see Jesus Christ high and lifted up, because as the young girls sang, only Jesus alone, only Jesus alone. So, Father, now as we open thy holy word, speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to open your Bibles to the New Testament book of Titus. The New Testament book of Titus. You'll find Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You'll come into the Thessalonians. Then you'll find Timothy. And after Timothy's, you will find Titus. And we are going to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. We continue our three-part series entitled, appropriately enough, Hope for the Homeland. Our three messages are quite simple. Last night, our message was entitled, Our Legacy, A Hope-Filled Past. Our message this morning is entitled, Our Lifestyle, A Hope-Filled Present. And our message this evening will be entitled, Our Longing, A Hope-Filled Future. If there is any place on this entire planet in which people should be keenly aware of their rich heritage and history and legacy as Seventh-day Adventists, it's right here in Michigan. You should have said a louder amen than that. (laughs) Beloved, the pioneers are buried here. This is the place where Seventh-day Adventism began, and we should be in a unique way connected with our incredible legacy. Last night, we concluded with these words. In a world that is spinning out of control, we as Bible-believing Seventh-day Adventists have a unique contribution to offer to those around us. We know where we are from, We know why we are here, and hallelujah, we know where we are going. Our legacy is a hope-filled past, but thank God in heaven, we are a church with more than a hope-filled past. We are heirs of a hope-filled present and a hope-filled future. We have a unique legacy, a unique lifestyle, and a unique longing, and Jesus Christ is at the center of all three. I'm proud to be a Seventh-day Adventist, aren't you? Our message this morning, our lifestyle, a hope-filled present. In a few short months, beginning on September 13th, this conference with the Lake Union and now apparently the North Pacific Union will launch the largest evangelistic thrust that this division has ever seen, and we're calling it Hope for the Homeland. I personally believe that we will baptize thousands in this meeting. Why should the Seventh-day Adventists in Africa and South America and Papua New Guinea get to have all the fun? Now, I love a good mission story as much as the next person, but I'm so tired of the mission stories being over there. I want them here. In these meetings where the gospel will be preached with power, we will invite people to join God's end-time people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. We will extend the hand of Christian fellowship to any and all who long to rise above and eventually leave behind this world of sin and sorrow and death. We will invite them to become members of God's church and many, 
very many, I believe, will accept the invitation. Now, incredibly, the reason that many will say yes and accept the invitation is the very reason that many others will say no and reject the invitation. Let me explain. The Seventh-day Adventist Church possesses not only the beauty of a scripturally rich history and a glorious heavenly future, but also a wonderful, if peculiar, present. We call this peculiar present our lifestyle. That is the style by which we live our life. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it how? More abundantly. Now, the more abundantly spoken of here is not simply a quantity of years. It is a quality of life. The hope of the Adventist church is not, as we said yesterday, a dry pie in the sky by and by. It is the present hope of a fuller, better, and sweeter life in the here and now. Did you catch that? It is the hope of a fuller, a better, and a sweeter life in the here and now. Seventh-day Adventists are not better. They're just Peculiar. You like that? (laughs) Write that inside of your Bible. Seventh-day Adventists are not better, just peculiar. I am told that there was a day in which you could tell if somebody was a Seventh-day Adventist just by looking at them. In some places, like Michigan, that's still true. Today, I want to bring forcibly to your mind the blessing, the beauty, and the necessity of the unique Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle. Let's take a look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, and I begin in verse 11. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. In this letter, Paul is writing to a man named Titus who was laboring on the island of Crete. We don't know much about Titus, but we know that he was converted from paganism. And we know that he was a man of great faith. Titus chapter 2. Verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to how many men? All men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from how much iniquity? All iniquity and purify unto Himself. Here's that word. A what kind of people? A peculiar people. Underline that word. Zealous of good works. Our text today is taken from Titus chapter 2. We actually will have another text. And that one is from Proverbs chapter 13. Let us begin by taking a look, a deeper look at the passage that we just read. Notice with me in verse 11. Verse 11 again. The Bible says the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Notice that grace is the starting point and the very center of the passage. And beloved, grace is the starting point and the center of the entire Bible. Amen? Grace is right here at the heart of our passage. And notice that this grace is powerful enough to save and it is pervasive enough so that everybody knows about it. Did you get that? The grace of God that brings salvation. In other words, it is qualified. It's the kind of grace that saves, but it says that it has appeared to how many, beloved? To all men. So it is not only powerful, it is pervasive. How is it today that the grace of God has appeared to all men? In the cross of Calvary, God has demonstrated His love and His disposition toward humanity. In the cross of Calvary, we see the grace of God epitomized and revealed. But the cross is not the only place where the grace of God appears. You can see the grace of God in a a fresh blade of grass springing from the ground. 
The grace of God is apparent in the trees and in the birds and in the flowers and in the beautiful landscapes of mountains and meadows. The grace of God pervades the very atmosphere in which we breathe. Amen? The grace of God is apparent even in the lives of converted Christians. The Apostle Paul here makes no equivocation. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared not just to a few, but to everybody. Everybody has been exposed to the grace of Jesus. Verse 12. In verse 12 he continues, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live, notice this, soberly, righteously, and godly, in this present world. Notice with me that it says teaching us. Grace not only saves, but grace also teaches. Did you get that, yes or no? Grace not only has salvational power, grace has educational power. Grace is more than unmerited favor. According to the passage, grace has an instructive component. It is not merely to save us, it is to save us and then to teach us how to live. Grace is the starting point and grace teaches us how to live. When the world looks more and more like the devil himself, we should be looking more and more like Jesus Christ. The contrast between the world and the Christian should be stark and plain. While the world is tending downward, the Christian is to be aiming upward. And that is what he says in the passage. If we wanted to paraphrase the passage up to this point, it could be very simple. Grace teaches us and saves us and empowers us to be like Jesus. Did you get that? Grace teaches, grace saves, and grace empowers us to be like our Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, the entire passage, from verse 11 to verse 14, hinges on a small phrase. And I want to show you that small phrase at the end of verse 12. Everything in the passage hinges on this phrase. And notice it with me. Teaching us, verse 12, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly. And here is the passage. In this, what is the next word? Present world. This is not pie in the sky, beloved. This is here and now. The whole passage hinges right here. Everybody will act like a saint in heaven, but the trick is to be a saint here and now. Did you get that? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, turning our back on the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, we should live like saints and Christians in the here and now, this present world. And this has everything to say about the unique Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle. We do not believe that the salvation that God gives us is simply a forensic salvation where He declares that we are like Jesus when really we're like the devil. We believe that the Lord Jesus not only declares us righteous, but He's going to make us righteous by His grace. In this present world, everything hinges on that passage. We continue in verse 13. Verse 13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking. I suppose that means that we should keep our eyes open. Amen? We should keep our eyes open. We should be sober. That means that we should stay away from the world's intoxicating delights and drugs and distractions. It is, in fact, the blessed hope. Looking for the blessed hope. We're going to speak all about the blessed hope this evening in our third message Our longing, a hope-filled future. Well, the last verse of our passage, verse 14. The last verse of our passage says, Who gave himself for us, speaking of Jesus, that he might redeem us from all iniquity 
and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. I want you to notice that according to the first part of verse 14, Jesus gave himself for us. Now, can a Christian say amen to that? Now, if Jesus gave himself for us, then we are to reciprocate in an act of mutuality and we are to give ourselves to him. There is reciprocity here. There is exchange here. He gives us his life and we give him our life. Who gave himself for us? Why did he give himself to us? The passage says that. So that. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. The word redeem means to rescue. What word did I say? Rescue. The connotation that is here uh, being, being delivered is one very much like Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. And they shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins, not in their sins, but from their sins. The picture here is one of Jesus coming and scooping His people up, rescuing them, not just from the penalty of iniquity, but from iniquity itself. Who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. One commentary put it this way, and listen carefully. God's plan is to restore in lost men the original image in which they were created. The process of sanctification consists of the grace of God acting upon the fully dedicated will of man so that every trace of sin may be completely removed from the life. And that is this side of heaven. I still believe in victory, brothers and sisters. To deliver men from the alluring power of sin and to lead him into habits of righteousness demands nothing less than the power of God. Because of sinful habits etched deeply within his life, man has no other resort than to grasp the rescuing hand of God for complete deliverance. The only hand that is extended is the hand of God. If we would be saved, we must grab that hand. There are no other options. We are in the middle right now of an evangelistic meeting. And we have a dear sister who is coming to our meeting and she is sweet as can be and we have nice conversations in the foyer when the meeting is done and she has made it crystal clear to me from the outset of the meetings she is a Buddhist and don't try to convert her. Now I wonder why she's coming nightly to the meetings. But we have some nice discussions. And we got into a discussion one evening there in the foyer and she was talking to me about the enlightenment that she has been experiencing not by looking outside but looking inside. And I said to her, Mary, I appreciate what you have said deeply but I just have to be candid with you. When I look inside my heart, all I see is darkness, gross darkness. And I said the difference between Buddhism and Christianity is that Buddhism reaches inside for salvation and Christianity reaches to an external salvation, to a salvation that is given by God Himself. And you know what? She started thinking. She said, that's an interesting way of looking at it. We're having dinner on Wednesday. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we don't reach inside. Because our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We cannot know it. Somebody has to come rescue us from our condition. Can you say amen? And the rescuing hand that reaches down from the very celestial throne is the hand of Jesus Christ. And that hand is wrapped firmly around humanity and the other hand is wrapped firmly around the throne and He is a bridge between the lowest of the low and the highest of the high. He will redeem us from all iniquity, and then one of my favorite words, and purify. Now, you know what the word purify means, right? It means to clean up, to wash. When I became a Christian, many of my academic peers and many of my punk rock peers accused me of having been brainwashed. You know what I said to them? I said, gentlemen, my brain could use a good washing. <laughs> Amen? Amen? 
He will purify unto himself a peculiar people. And I want to hone in on that word peculiar. Now, I am very aware that I am reading from the authorized 1611 King James Version, the one that Paul used. And I am aware that the word peculiar had a slightly different connotation in the Elizabethan English. It meant more to do with receiving unto oneself. But you will allow me a little homiletical liberty here. I want to tell you what the dictionary says peculiar means in our modern vernacular. Here it is. Odd. (laughs) Strange. Weird. And my personal favorite, atypical. (laughs) Don't worry, they said essentially the same things about Jesus. Have you ever read the book Fundamentals of Christian Education? Have you ever read the red book Fundamentals on Christian Education? If you have, you would have come to page 289 and you would have found yourself reading this one sentence. When we reach the standard that the Lord would have us reach, the world will regard Seventh-day Adventists as odd, singular, straight-laced extremists. Did you get that? When we reach the standard that God would have us reach as a people, the world will look at us and they'll say they're odd, they're singular, they're straight-laced extremists. And I love it because odd and singular are synonyms of peculiar and that is exactly what God is looking for. If you are in the crowd, you will spend a lot of time in the crowd at the end of the millennium on the outside of the city. But brothers and sisters, if we will choose to be by the grace of God, if we will choose to be by the Spirit of God who empowers our will and gives us volition, if we will choose to be amongst God's end time people, we will be sober, we will be righteous, we will be holy, we will be purified, and praise God, hallelujah, we'll be peculiar. Let's paraphrase the passage up to this point. Keep looking for Jesus' second coming, says Paul. He's the one who cleaned you up and made you special to Him. That He might purify unto Himself a peculiar people. Well, what makes them so peculiar? The passage tells you right there. A peculiar people that are zealous, not of worldliness, but zealous of good works. Can you say amen? Now, let's set the record straight on this, beloved. We are not saved by works. We are not saved by works. The Bible makes it clear that we're not saved by our good works. We are saved for the purpose of doing good works. In my evangelistic meetings, I have to bring this across to our dear Sunday-keeping friends who, when you mention the Sabbath, they think that you're keeping the Sabbath in order to be saved, and we know we don't keep the Sabbath in order to be saved. Amen? And this is how I explain it. I say this. Now, does an apple tree bear apples in order to be an apple tree or because it is an apple tree? Now, you answer the question. Does an apple tree bear apples in order to be an apple tree? Yes or no? No, but because it is an apple tree. And Christians do not do good works in order to be saved, but because we are saved. Why why do people struggle over this? This is so simple. God has saved us. He has rescued us. He is purifying us. And He wants us to do good works. Nothing wrong with works. Works is not a four-letter word. It's a five-letter word. Works. Now, let's look at our second text. I think we've got a good grasp on Titus chapter 2. The short paraphrase is this. If you believe Jesus is coming soon, live like it. Let's go to our second passage. This one's in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs in the Old Testament... Just after the book of Psalms, Proverbs chapter 13. We have been emphasizing that the hope that we as Seventh-day Adventists possess 
is not only a past hope, it is not only a future hope, but it is a present hope. And in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 12, we read these words. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Hope that is put off, hope that is prolonged, hope that is procrastinated will only make the heart sick. But when you realize the hope, when you realize the expectation, when you apprehend that hope, it's like a tree of life, brothers and sisters. God has not only given us a hope clear off in the distant future, pie in the sky, by and by, not only has He given us a hope clear back in 1844, but we have a hope right here today in 2002. It is not a deferred hope. It is not a put off hope. It is not a protracted hope. It is a current hope. Hope that is deferred make, makes the heart sick. But when the desire cometh, It is a tree of life. God has given us hope right here and right now. It is the hope of an abundant Christian life. Listen carefully. The blessing of living sweeter, longer, better, and more fulfilled lives. We quote again from John 10.10. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Because repetition deepens impression, I repeat, the abundant life spoken of here is not simply a quantity of years, it is a quality of existence. It is not a hope deferred, put off, but a hope realized and experienced. God has a hope for you today. Did you hear what I said? God has a hope for you when? Today. Right here and right now. You can enter it into it this very moment. It is the abundant blessing of the Christian, yea, the Seventh-day Adventist Christian lifestyle. The way some people talk and act, you would think that the Christian life was the highest form of pain and drudgery. You'd think that God was just waiting to make your life miserable and take away all your fun. This is particularly true in some of our academies. You stand up and you preach Jesus, and all they can think about is all the fun things they don't get to do anymore. Some people carry on as though God wants to take them to heaven just so He can throw them into prison, said C.D. Brooks. Christians don't have any fun, we are told. Let's set the record straight on this right now. Are you ready? I have had more fun... I have had more true joy in my last month as a Christian than in my first 23 years as a non-Christian. What the world calls fun is a lie of the highest order. The world calls fun, what the world calls fun is usually associated with pain and death. Let me enumerate for you a few of the fun activities that the Christian gets to avoid. Are you ready? A few of the fun things that that we we don't get to participate in when we become Christians. Number one, dying of venereal disease contracted during a one-night stand. Number two, waking up weekend after weekend with a throbbing, painful hangover. Number three, having your heart broken after a premarital sexual experience. Number four, losing all of your teeth to a drug called speed. Number five, losing your mind to drugs like marijuana, cocaine, ecstasy, or heroin. Number six, losing all of your money in a late night poker game. Number seven, watching your family break up over an ongoing affair. Number eight, dying of lung cancer or emphysema contracted while smoking cigarettes. Number nine, dying of liver disease from alcohol consumption. Number ten, dying of obesity or heart disease because of habitual intemperance. Number, the next one, ruining your family by not keeping the Sabbath and becoming a workaholic. And two more, 
destroying your tender conscience by watching filthy, violent, repugnant, repulsive movies. And last but not least, going so far into credit card debt that you have to file bankruptcy. Just a few of the wonderful joys and privileges that we as Christians get to avoid. Can you say amen? amen. Brothers and sisters, listen to me now. The devil is a liar. And he's the father of lies. Christians do have more fun. But more importantly, they have more joy. And joy is better than fun. It is based on principle and it lasts longer. The Bible never uses the word fun. Isn't that interesting? I typed it into my computer just this morning. The word fun does not appear in the Bible. But the word joy appears 200 times. Joy is lasting, but fun is fleeting. Joy comes from knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Joy comes from possessing a hope-filled past, a hope-filled present, and a hope-filled future. The inimitable Christian author and satirist G.K. Chesterton maintained that joy, quote, is the very centerpiece of the Christian life. Did you get that? Joy is the very centerpiece of the Christian life. I'm tempted to agree. Let me share with you a few passages of Scripture. 1 John 1, 4. And these things we write unto you that your joy may be full. 1 Peter 1, 8. Whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory... 1 Thessalonians 3, 9, For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? Philippians 1, 25, And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. Did you get that? The joy associated with faith. How about Galatians 5, 22 and 23? You know this one by heart, don't you? But the fruit of the Spirit is love. And what's the very next thing? Joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And two more, John 16 and verse 24. Jesus now speaking. Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be fool. Jesus is not a killjoy. Amen? He's a full joy. He wants our joy to be full, not dead. And the last one, John 17 and verse 13, and now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have joy fulfilled in themselves. Beloved, while we might not get to participate in some of the fun that the world has, most of what the world calls fun, I repeat, is nothing more than death and destruction disguised as fun. Most people are slaves to their various brands of fun. You knew that, right? They're slaves to it. And it's almost a relationship of necessity. They're enslaved to it. They can't get away from it. And so they call it fun because they don't have a choice but to call it fun. But we are liberated. And brothers and sisters, we are not tied with the tentacles of Satan to this world and its so-called fun and pleasures. We can experience true, earnest Christian joy, which is the cornerstone of the Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle. We are called to be glad Venists, not sad Venists, and never mad Venists. Back to our text in Proverbs chapter 13. Hope deferred, verse 12, maketh the heart sick. Brothers and sisters, on this beautiful Sabbath morning, I am rejoicing that we do not have a deferred hope. Amen? We have a present hope. In fact, we love to sing it. 214 in the hymnal. We have this hope. Not we'll get it. Not future tense. Not we had past tense, but we present tense have this hope. Amen? 
The remainder of our message will be divided into four short parts. I want to speak to you this morning in a very open and candid yet sincere way. The Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle is the lifestyle. I'll never forget, I was listening to a sermon by one of my, my, my dearest and most favorite ministers. I've never met the man personally, but I have enjoyed listening to literally hours of his sermons on tapes. One of the elder statesmen of our church, a man named C.D. Brooks. I was listening to a sermon. And he was preaching on the distinctive Adventist lifestyle and he said something in there that has stuck in my mind and this is what he said. He said, even if there was no God, I'd still live the same way I live. And then he went on to elaborate to say, the life that I have now is better than the life I had before. Even if there was no God, my life is better than before. Now, I like that. What do we stand to lose by living the Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle? Nothing. But beloved, I'm here to tell you tonight, there is a God. And there is a gospel. And more than that, there is a lifestyle. A style of life. This peculiar lifestyle ministers to the human machinery in four ways. Four ways. Number one, it is a message for the mind. Number two, it is a message for the body. Number three, it is a message for the soul. And number four, it is a message for the family. Did you get that? Number one, it is a message for the mind. The Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle, yea, the biblical lifestyle, preserves the mind and appeals to the mind. As Seventh-day Adventists, in keeping with the standards set forth in the Bible, we choose to abstain from all harmful substances such as drugs and narcotics and alcohol, tobacco, nicotine, caffeine, etc. We choose to refrain from these things because we believe that our mind is like an antenna. What word did I say? It's an antenna. You see, if some terrible thing happened in, a, in maybe an accident in a car or something and I got my foot chopped off, I could still have a relationship with Jesus. Amen? Even if my whole leg got chopped off, I could still have a relationship with Jesus, couldn't I? Even if I lost both of my legs and both of my arms and I was just a trunk and a neck and a head, I could still have a meaningful relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But if I lose my mind, I cannot... God doesn't communicate through the elbow. God doesn't communicate through the shoulder. God doesn't communicate through the stomach. God communicates through the mind. It's an antenna. Now the devil knows this. And so he wants to cloud the antenna. He wants to send mixed signals. And so we can't discern. He wants to get us addicted and bound to things on this earth. But Jesus says, no, you keep that highway clear. You keep that antenna clear so I can be in constant communion with you. The Seventh-day Adventist message is a message for the mind. Not only does it preserve the mind, it appeals to the mind. And listen carefully. The truth of the Bible as understood by Seventh-day Adventists is so perfectly cogent and coherent that it it appeals to the rational intellectual mind. It is not dumbed-down religion. The Seventh-day Adventist message is logically sound and existentially compelling. This is particularly true in reference to the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Men and women of the highest intellectual culture have been drawn to these incredible and predictive prophecies. The book, The Great Controversy, will supply even the most discerning mind with enough sublime thoughts to last a lifetime. Now, I know that there's something in that book, The Great Controversy, because that book could take a college student who knew it all. Ever met a college student like that? I used to be one. I knew everything. Just ask me, right? And I sat down with that book and suddenly new vistas, new horizons of truth that I had never even thought of began to dawn on me. And I realized that instead of knowing everything, I knew nothing. 
And brothers and sisters, I can still read that book, and I still do read that book. And it appeals not only to the heart, it appeals to the mind. The Bible is an intelligent book for intelligent people, and Seventh-day Adventists are interpreting the Bible correctly. Number two, it is a message for the body. Go with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. A message for the body. Verse 1. The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your what? Bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. Notice that we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, and in the presentation of our bodies, our mind is renewed. Maybe you've not seen that in the text before. As we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, that renews the mind. And Seventh-day Adventists are keenly aware that there is a direct correlation, a reciprocity between a healthy body and a healthy mind, and an unhealthy body and an unhealthy mind. The SDA lifestyle recognizes that the gift of life and of the body is a gift from God and treats them both with the greatest care and responsibility. We believe that our bodies are on loan from God Himself. We are not owners, but we are stewards and we are managers. Did you get that? Beloved Seventh-day Adventist, don't eat just anything. And Seventh-day Adventists don't drink just anything. And Seventh-day Adventists don't smoke anything. (laughs) We recognize that there is a very close and keen connection between the mind and the body. If the mind is sick, the body will be sick and vice versa. We have the present hope of health. Adventists not only live longer, approximately seven years on the average, but they live better because the mind and the body through healthful living are fully intact right up into the last years of life. I have seen it again and again. Can you say amen? Amen. We're not simply talking about a quantity of years. Though scientific studies have affirmed that Adventists live longer by about seven years on the average, than the rest of the population. Not only do we live longer, but we live better. There are so many passages that we could go to. We could go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We could find that our body is the temple. We could go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and we could find the same thing. But the passage I want to direct your attention to is Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You know, it's interesting, that word sacrifice is almost always associated with death. You read the Old Testament, a sacrifice is associated with death. But here the apostle takes that word that is always associated with death and he transforms it and says a living sacrifice. I read in the fifth volume of the testimony several years ago in which we are told that it is a solemn thing to die but it is a far more solemn thing to live. God is not looking only for people today who are willing to die for him. God today is looking for people who are willing to live for Him. Do you want to know how to put your doctor out of business? You ready? You want to put your doctor out of business? Here it goes. Number one, eat right. You with me? I'm sure you're aware that virtually all of the dietary and nutritional counsels that were given to us by the pen of inspiration 150 years ago have been perfectly confirmed by modern medical science. You want to live longer? You want to put your doctor out of business? Just start eating right. Number two, get some exercise. Amen? 
Get some exercise. All right? It's good to sweat. You should get exercise every single day. Amen. We love to talk about diet. We need to get exercise too. In fact, medical science is telling us that exercise is the single factor more than any other factor that affects both longevity and quality of life. Get some exercise, beloved. It's okay to eat a tofu burger, but go take a walk when you're done. Do some jumping jacks. You know what I did? In the basement of my house, I built a little climbing wall. It's not real exciting. It's only about eight feet tall, but it's fun. And I crawl around on it like a monkey and I get exercise. You do whatever's best for you, but get some exercise. Amen? Number three, drink some water. Drink some water. Now, nobody likes grape juice more than me. My wife will tell you that. At the end of every meal, I have just a small glass of grape juice just to, just to bring the meal to a close, to bring finality to the meal. But brothers and sisters, we should also drink water and drink lots of it. It will keep your body in good health. Number four, get some sunshine. Amen? Get, out, get outside and if you have to, roll those sleeves up and, and, and get some exposure. Let the sun touch your skin. Number five, don't eat too much. Practice temperance. Amen? Number six, take some, some, some breaths of fresh air every day. Just hold it. Every day, get fresh air. What kind of air? See, if you're like me and you live in Detroit, I see people running around in Detroit and I think these people are mad. Because they're running and they're getting their lungs all worked up into agitation and then they just breathe in carbon monoxide. Get out in the country and get some fresh air. Amen? Two more. Get some rest. Go to bed a little earlier. Amen? Nothing wrong with going to bed by nine. Are you with me? Now, I know my father-in-law is sitting in here somewhere right now and he's saying, you'd better practice what you preach, preacher. Because my father-in-law is Romanian. And he is one of these fellas that is very, very disciplined. And when the sun goes down, he goes down. So I know I'm going to hear about this one later. And last of all, you know it, just trust in God. There's the eight-part prescription known as the New Start Remedy. If you will apply that, your body will be healthy, your mind will be healthy, and your doctor will be out of business. And we'll employ him as a preacher. Last two, number three, not only is the Seventh-day Adventist message a message for the mind, not only is it a message for the body, it is a message for the soul. The Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle and message satisfies the deepest longings of the soul. Jesus Christ is the center of this lifestyle, and the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10, you are complete in Christ. In Christ we find the great longing of the soul. Augustine, in the book, the, the, the City of God, wrote these words. He said, we wander around tired and restless until we find our rest in you. He spoke of a God-shaped void in the heart. And we try to put other things into that God-shaped void, but it's like trying to put a square peg into a round hole. Nothing quite fills it. But Jesus Christ is the perfect puzzle piece, and it slides in perfectly. It ministers not only to the body, it ministers not only to the mind. The Adventist message ministers to the deepest longings of the soul. And last but not least, the Seventh-day Adventist message is a message for families. Let's go to our last text, the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 4. If time would allow, we could go into detail, into the Elijah message. We don't have time. But let me just inform you that I believe the Elijah messenger of the last days is the Seventh-day Adventist church. I believe a careful and candid study of Scripture will reveal that. I'm not just grandstanding here. I'm not preaching triumphalism or elitism here. I believe that a careful study of the Bible will reveal that. 
And with that in mind, read with me the last two verses of the Old Testament. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, let me impress your mind, and we'll talk more about it this evening. We are living before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. I'm not a time setter, but I want to go on record as saying that everything is in place for Jesus to come. This thing could wrap up in very short order. In verse 6, And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. God has given us the Adventist message. The lifestyle, not only to minister to mind, body, and soul, but to minister to our families. And beloved, this became especially poignant to me about one year ago when my wife gave birth. I used to read the text about the heart of a father and was unaffected. As I read these texts now and I look at my little son who's just a year old and already he's beginning to burgeon and blossom with personality and I love that little boy. I think to myself, how could I love him any more than I love him right now? And then the next day comes and I love him a little more. And beloved, the idea of my, my son growing up and being a teenager and turning away from me, it breaks my heart. And now when I meet with my parishioners and other Adventists who have young people who are outside of the church, I can weep with them because I can, I can empathize. And God in heaven looks down. He is the Supreme Father. He looks down and He says, I empathize with your lost son, your lost daughter. I empathize with the fact that you raise your children right. You brought them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and by, by their own will, their own volition, they turned away. I feel your pain, says God the Father. He's the greatest parent there ever was and he lost a third of his children. And he didn't make any mistakes. Beloved, I believe in the last days there will be a resurgence a resurgence in which people will see a coming together of families, that lost son, that lost daughter coming back to Jesus. I believe that we could see in the last days a revival, not only of primitive godliness, but of primitive family values. And oh, I just believe in all my heart that if we will gather our children every day around the family altar, and we will have morning worship with them. And we will begin the day with Jesus. That doesn't guarantee that they'll stay in the church, but it sure gets them going in the right direction. And you might say, but my, my children are gone now. They're out of the house and some of them are out of the church. Well, then do what Job did. Gather every day and ac offer the sacrifices of praise and say, God, bring back my children. Do not let the Lord Jesus have one second of rest until you see your children safe in the bosom of Christ and the church again. I want to tell you something. God is going to bring many of the young people back. And I don't think He's going to do it through all these new fandangled methodologies. I think He's going to do it through the preaching of the Word. Well, let's close this thing. Listen to my words carefully. Anyone can become a Seventh-day Adventist. But not just anyone can be a Seventh-day Adventist. Did you get the distinction? Anyone can become a Seventh-day Adventist. But not just anyone can be a Seventh-day Adventist. Because, brothers and sisters, we have a message, a Bible message. We have a message that teaches not only hope for the future, not only hope for the past, but hope in the here and now. We have a, a peculiar lifestyle and God is calling us to be holy and righteous in this present world. Holy in mind, holy in body, holy in soul, and holy in our families. Can you say amen? We have a present hope. We have a hope right here and right now. And on September 13th, throughout all this great nation, we will invite people through Christ and His Word to enter into the hope that we have. A past hope, a present hope, and a future hope. And brothers and sisters, I want to emphasize again that many people will accept. Now today, I just want to thank the Lord Jesus Christ 
for the peculiar yet beautiful and holy lifestyle that he has committed to Seventh-day Adventists. I want to say thank you, Jesus. Do you? Let's say it together. Thank you, Jesus. And maybe you've backslidden on some of these principles. Or maybe you've never actually practiced any of these principles. Beloved, I want to make an appeal right now. And the appeal is very simple. As we have enumerated the four areas, the four areas that the Seventh-day Adventist message strikes, just as an arrow to the heart. The issue of mind, the issue of body, the issue of family, and the issue of soul. If there is an area, if there is a particular place in your experience that you have that you have slidden away from where you used to be or maybe you've never advanced to where you know you should be I'm not talking about the gospel right this second I'm talking right now about the issue of lifestyle and you want to say right now in the sight not of David but in the sight of Jesus Jesus you have given me this great lifestyle you have given me this joy you have given me this present hope but I have turned away from it through selfish indulgence through the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and I want to begin practicing in authenticity the Seventh-day Adventist message and the Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle is there somebody here today that wants to say with the raising of their hand count me in brothers and sisters praise God Praise God. I believe we have a present hope, do you? I believe we have a past hope, do you? And tonight you're going to see we have a future hope. Let us pray. Father in heaven, you have called us to be holy. You have called us to be peculiar. Lord, apart from Jesus, we can be neither. But through His power, strength, and enabling grace, you can purify unto yourself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Father, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And so please, Father, help us to enter into the present hope, the present beauty, and the present lifestyle of being a Seventh-day Adventist, Bible-believing, Spirit-filled Christian. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.